Welcome to another episode of That Some Crazy Shit with Kelly and James. I, by now, you know who I am. I need no introduction. But no. my friend, he does. The one, the only, the magnificent, the fabulous, Mr. James. Ta-da! Thank you, my friend. That you was think, quite the intro. Yeah, right you now. think you're getting applause right now? Yeah, after the cyber world, someone's applauding. Yay. Right on, right on. So we are back with an episode, and this is something, James, we have never really delved into when we talk about crazy shit. We've done paranormal, we've done ghosts, psychics, cryptids, but we've never talked about Atlantis. Right? Not on the air. Not on the air. We've yeah, never really air. dived into Atlantis. And so today, our guest is a subject matter expert on Atlantis. So much that he's written a book. And it's funny because, you know, in the 70s, maybe early 80s, there was a lot of literature coming out about Atlantis. Yeah, and there was. Kind of, and it's kind of died down. And then when I saw he wrote a book, I was like, oh, this is interesting. So the book is called Atlantis Solved, The Definitive Proof. His name is David Edward, and he is here to talk about what he knows about Atlantis. The cool thing about David is that he's an author. He's written like a ton of books, all fiction. But he did say that this particular book is nonfiction. Yeah. And I like the way it started, how, he, how his journey to this book started in school. Yeah. So what do you want to do? You want to get right to it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Welcome to our podcast. That's some crazy shit. Author and subject matter expert on Atlantis, David Edward. David, welcome to That's Some Crazy Shit. How are you? I am doing wonderful. How are you guys? I'm good here in Utah. We talked about how lucky I am to live here earlier. So You are lucky to live in <laughs> Utah. Second luckiest person uh, to Kelly who lives in Colorado, which is the <laughs> most awesomest state in the world. It is so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> in so many ways. So awesome. But she no, thank it in too. Every day. <laughs> But thank you, David, for, for joining us. You know, I know that you've written many, many, many books, but the one that I think piqued our interest was Atlantis, because you told me you consider that to be your nonfiction work. It's true. It, it is it is absolutely a work of nonfiction, which is unique for an Atlantis book, by the way. Um, and uh, it's also, I, I almost said it was my most recent book. It was my most, most recent book up until Tuesday, this past Tuesday, because I have another book that came out, but uh, it's not about Atlantis, so I won't, I won't plug it here. So tell us about, like, how did you go about getting your research and ma what made you even want to write this book? Well, look, I'm a nerd, right? I'm the I'm the only nerd on this call. Looking at you guys, yeah, uh, so, yeah. I'm, I'm a foreign foreign entity as far as you're concerned. But you know, look, when I I grew up, and I'm I'm an older person, I guess we can say. So I, you know, my my formative years when I was a little tiny kid was in the '70s, um, and we got you know it wasn't too much of a different world, but it was kind of a big deal to get a new television show or a new book about something cool. Um, and at the time, you know, Eric Von Danigan had put his book out, Finger, uh, I almost said Fingerprints of the Gods, uh, 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 Chariots of the Gods. Chariots, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was just I was just into this stuff, right? So I've been into it all my life. And uh, I read a lot just casually um, about ancient Greece and Plato. And, I, I, you know, I, that, that's, that's my time period, which is where this story comes from. Um, and then about uh, maybe six, eight months ago, you know, I had listened to all the uh, That's Some Crazy Bleep uh, podcast that I could possibly listen to. In fact, I, I listened to all of yours like five or six times. So, so I was out of, out of that content. Um, and I was, I'm an old guy, so I can't sleep. So I was flipping around on YouTube and I ran across this guy, Jimmy Corsetti, uh, of a channel called Bright Insight. And apparently in 2018, he put this place forward this called the Rishat Structure. And he said it looked an awful lot like Atlantis to him. And he's done a lot of good videos that, that have lots of viewership where he tries to kind of prove it. Um, and I watched him and, and it was like, I think this guy's onto something. Uh, now he didn't get everything right. It wasn't it wasn't like a rigorous scientific or academic approach. It was more of a, a casual, interested, um, 
you know, just layman's approach. Uh, so I wanted to, so I thought, my Lord, if, if this, if he's found it, if this is it, someone needs to step in here kind of independently and apply a, a little more of a scientific approach to this and see if we can verify or see how much of it we can verify. And there's some criticisms of this site too. This Rishat structure is what it's called, the Eye of the Sahara. So I wanted to go and tackle those um, criticisms, but I wanted to do it all independently, which I did. So so basically I came in as an independent um, you know, observer or whatever you want to call it. And I started from scratch. I started from nothing. I started from the base material and I kind of worked my way against his assumptions and just against this, this site and what we know about it. Um, and I realized that I think this is it, uh, way different than a lot of other places. So I'm like, you know what? I, I, someone needs to write this down. So I wrote it down and hence we have the book Atlanta Solved. I love it. It's funny when you were mentioning uh, the time period, that's the same time period I was in reading uh, Charles Berlitz. I remember it was my first exposure to Atlantis. Yeah. So when you, when you said you had a book, I'm like, oh, I've got, we've got to talk to, see what what the update is because back then i remember they said it was in the bermuda triangle area yeah yeah so and and that's still a popular opinion based around the azor islands here's here's the thing so this rishat structure it's in the western sahara desert in a, in a country called mauritania which just that name sounds kind of cool to me mauritania <laughs> um but you can anyone can read Plato. So so what we know about Atlantis, Pl Plato is what we call a primary source. And he's the only primary source we have. So a lot of stuff that everyone else has written uh, about Atlantis, here, here's kind of the formula. The formula goes, whether it's a TV show or a book, the first half of whatever it is, like if it's a TV show, it's a beautiful travelogue, right? So we get to watch people go to, uh, you know, the Bimini Islands, or, you know, you know they, they go around the, the Greek and the Mediterranean, uh, Santorini, and it's just, you know, and, you know, we're just like, wow, this is really, and, and the whole first half, they're setting you up saying, we found it, here we go. And then the entire second half, after the studios paid for their, you know, travel vacation, uh, you kind of get, but for this to fit, it's, we got to pretend like Plato got this and this wrong, and we got to add this in, and we got to change this, and then it could be one of these three or four places, but no one knows, and the search continues. Um, and that has been the formula since I've been alive. Every show I've watched has that same formula. Um, so with this Rishat structure thing, we don't have to do any of that. Uh, this place can be Atlantis and, and line up with everything Plato said. I, in my book, it lines up 99.32%. So I mean, you know, basically um, uh, all of it lines up. And we don't have to dismiss, change, criticize, or challenge any of our current beliefs any of the the, the, the the academic current beliefs about our history. Um, so it, we don't have to change anything. And this place fits the description with, with known, you know, scientific uh, of the day, science of the day and all that stuff. Um, and it, 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 the, dig, the, the more you dig into the source material, the more it matches, not, not the less. So it's kind of the only place that's ever been presented that, that has that criteria, that, 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 that meets all the criteria about everything we know about ourselves and the world and history and, and all of that. Um, so I, I think that's kind of important on some level. So what happened to Atlantis? Well, the story is, and we get the story from Plato, who got it from a guy named Solon, um, and this all comes in a dialogue called, uh, called Critias, and Critias is the one talking and Plato's the one uh, recording it. And to jump to the end of the story, Kelly, I can see you're a person that likes to read the last couple pages of the book, right? <laughs> Screw all that setup, let's just find out what happened. But, but the basic story is that the Atlanteans um, were very good at agriculture and they were very good at organizing themselves. And as all societies do at some point, they felt they needed to expand after they reached a certain level of maturity. And they had waged war and they had conquered Libya and Egypt and parts of Europe, which would be you know to the north of the Mediterranean. And they had set their sights on whatever was going on in Greece in 9600 BC. And we can get, I can explain how we get to that date, but that, that's the date that he winds up talking about. And they get to they get there, and then the Greeks kind of beat them back, and they beat them back all the way to their city. And it's about to be the big final battle, and then a giant um, wave or something happens, and the sea swallows Atlantis and kills everyone, and the world is cast into a cataclysm. And then it takes thousands of years, you know, to kind of reemerge, uh, you know, from a, from a society standpoint. So that's what we know. And he says it sank into the sea in a day and a night. Now that could be anything, right? Some people think that means it was on an island that blew up. Some people think uh, means it was on a continent that we can't find and doesn't exist that somehow 
got a flat and went underwater. I don't know, you know, what, whatever. <laughs> but what, what, what it looks like, if it's this place, what it looks like is it looks like a giant tsunami. Uh, and now the tsunami would have to be at least 500 feet tall to get from where the Atlantic Ocean is to where this Rishat structure is. It's about 345 miles inland, which, which actually fits the, Plato's description. Oh, wow. um, but the, high, the, the tallest recorded tsunami we know about is like 1,735 feet or something. So it's well within things we know that happen. And then when you look at that Atlantic Ridge that sits off the, the coast of Africa, you know, it's some of the thinnest um, land. Uh, you know, on the plates, the tectonic plates and everything. So we're talking about the end of the last ice age, something called the Younger Dryas, which, which we can talk more about. And we know within the course of like a year or two, the temperature of the planet rose like 40 degrees. So some people think maybe it was a comet, this, that, but you don't, you don't need any of that. If, if there was ice and then the temperature got hotter and now there's less ice, then uh, it's pushing down on the, on the tectonic plates and now it's not. So they're going to shift. They're going to do things. And it, it would be very natural for one of them to shift up, you know, which would cause a tsunami and have it, you know, then plow into the west coast of Africa. So that's what I think happened is it's a big wave. The, the source of the wave, we could debate it. I don't get into it because I, I try not to speculate in this book. Um, and I don't want to have to defend Younger Dryas Comet Impact Theory to be the reason why there was a wave. We don't know. But you, you can clearly see in the satellite images the results of the tsunami, which I think is very important. So we know it was a tsunami and we can see it. What exactly caused it? There are, some, there are two or three very likely candidates. Um, it, it could have been any of those. Well, now, what was the timeline for Atlantis? How long ago was this? So this is 9600 BCE. So, so the time period we're talking about is something called the pre-Pottery Neolithic. And Neolithic just means uh, ne Neo and Lithic, which just means new, new rocks. So it was the new Stone Age because the, differentiating it from the prior uh, Stone Age, it was during the Ice Age. We had all these ages. Um, and uh, what do you ask me? <laughs> uh, what was the timeline? How, how long ago it was? How long ago it was? Okay, yeah, sorry. So, so it's a pre-pottery Neolithic, 9600, and then, and uh, we also know about the same time. The other thing we know going on about 10,000 BC, so 400 years before this 9600 date, we see agriculture. We see these hunter-gatherers switching over in some small communities. Um, uh, starting to become what they call agrarian communities, where they grow stuff instead of kill stuff. Um, so that's kind of the timeline. We're kind of, a, we are, it, this is the very, very, very beginning that we can still see with our flashlights when we look back in time. Um, but we, we know that agriculture was going on for at least 400 years before uh, 9600 BC. And we know we're, we're rock solid in the middle of the uh, Neolithic period, the, the new stone age. And that means, and the pre-pottery. So when, we can't find pottery which we wouldn't expect to find and we haven't but we found tons of stone age tools which is just spears on the end of the sticks i mean you know it's basic stuff um and that's one level of you know advancement but but agriculture i was was like it was like the internet or it was it's just the biggest impact you could think of um and the other thing we know about this part of uh africa during this time it was what they call the green sahara so the Sahara Desert was green and it got lots of rainfall. Like I live in Florida and the climate would have been about the same as what I experienced here in Florida. I used to live in Colorado, which is why I, I shout props out to uh, Colorado. And I, and I love it. Um, but I, but, the, but the no income tax, no state income tax here drew me. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, it rains a lot here. So there would have been a lot of rain. You could have easily grown stuff, very temperate climate. Um, and then this structure presents its own advantages because you basically have a series of ringed islands in the middle of a giant lake, uh, which is really easy to defend. You know, the, the saber-toothed tigers uh, aren't going to swim out, you know, a mile into this thing and then get you. So it's a really good place for, for people of, of this time to have found and lived in. Matter of fact, it's, it almost, you almost would have to explain why they wouldn't have lived there, because we know people were there. We know what they were doing. Uh, so this is like an ideal place uh, to live um, when it comes to that time period. That is that is very cool. How long did it take you to do all of this research? Um, well, it's a tough question because I've been researching this all my life, you know. So, so I came to this with a lot of um, uh, baked in. I don't want to say knowledge, but just an, a big understanding of the literature. So I'd I've already read. I've read all of Plato's dialogues probably three or four or more or five or six times some of them um, so I didn't have to like dig into them and learn them I knew I was fairly familiar with them uh, I've read Herodotus which we can talk about because Herodotus another historian 
mentions Atlantis. I, I've read Xenophon. I've read all, all those people. So I so I knew that, and I've been looking at this. Look, I've seen every ancient alien. I've seen a TV show. You know, I, I've seen every show that was ever made on this. Every single one, even the even the bad ones. I love it. Uh, and I've read I've read most of the books, especially in the '90s, Graham Hancock and his his early works. Um, yeah, I like that. So so I was very you know you, in, in academia when you get into a topic you, you want to see what the literature says, and you can say you're well read in the literature. I was that with Atlantis, but understand Atlantis is kooky. So, you know, the, the literature is not on the same level as, as maybe some other fields. But all that aside, from the time I saw these videos to the time I got the book out, it was about four months, I'd say. Um, but I worked on it full time for those four months. So I really dedicated myself to, to this research. So I don't know much about Atlantis. But so were the Atlanteans a more supposed to be a more, what am I trying to say, advanced? advanced culture than the rest of us yeah that word advanced look there, there were no nuclear submarines there, there were no death ray crystals um, yeah the death ray crystals and none yeah. of those, there, were, there, there weren't spaceships and levitation and, and all that stuff um what plato tells us is very specific about the Atlanteans, and what plato generally looked for um is uh they were really 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 good at agriculture Bet, better and they were advanced and for, for that time period they were advanced from an agricultural standpoint um they were pretty good about organizing themselves they, they had divided the kingdom they had a king whose name was atlas uh and also by the way in this same area we have the atlas mountains in morocco to the north so we've got lots of geographic clues uh and then there were nine provinces outside of the the main capital and they had like they had a deal and they said look um we all agree that we don't uh, do war with each other and if any one of us is attacked we all respond kind of like nato you know what i mean so so that's advanced so he, he liked that kind of stuff that's where they were very advanced um where they weren't as advanced was the actual ability to wage warfare because we know they lost to whatever was going on with the uh whoever was in greece at 9600 bc and we can argue that that's before the the greece bronze ages before the mycenaeans i mean many people call them proto-greeks um, there's some debate to what was going on, but whatever it was, we're told, uh, it, they had they had bigger rocks and longer sticks, and they were able to push <laughs> the landing in the back. Yeah. So. Well, that, yeah. That see now you're starting to some of my childhood things are falling away now because <laughs> the, the, the magic crystals not real. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, but I tell people, look, well, you know, I often get the question, why is why are people so interested in Atlantis? And I'm like, I am. I don't know. It, it seems built into us on some level. Um, but I, I always explain it's like like Christmas when you were a kid. Um, and if, you, if you're having a good Christmas, uh, you can see the boxes start to pile up or the presents start to pile up under the tree. Right. And you stare at them and all you want to do is open them. Uh, but you stare at them for weeks and you're probably not allowed to open them or uh, you have to, you know, you can open one or whatever. But then Christmas comes and you get to open them. And, and you know, it's like socks and an undershirt and, you know, a pair of pajamas and, you know, and maybe you got a board game. So, so the point there is the anticipation and the dreaming about what could be in the presence is somehow more fun or engaging than actually knowing what's in the presence, even though, of course, you need socks and underwear and whatever else you would get. Uh, so I used to get, just get rocks and coal, uh, <laughs> but at least they weren't being thrown at me. So I figured, you know, that was a good Christmas. But yeah, yeah that, so, that was a good one. Yeah. So, I always so, thought Atlantis was like the TV show, the web <laughs> fingers. I can't remember the guy's name. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Pat, was it Patrick Pat, something? Pat, yeah, Dallas guy. The Dallas yeah, guy. Patrick yeah. Duffy. Patrick Duffy. <laughs> I loved that show. I, I watched that, that show as a kid. Abs See, so that's, no that's webs, exactly right. no web feet or hands going on in Atlantis. That was all just fiction. Yeah, you know, it's it's the same. It, it's probably the same species of humans that we are. You know, people forget there's twenty. There's been twenty three species of humans found um, that that we know of. So this was probably. The, the, our species it might have been neanderthals but you know it was a fairly modern species uh you know i don't think no, plato doesn't mention web feet or fingers let me put let me give you that much um so I'll just stick to the source material he doesn't mention that they had those so i don't know so if they're fighting wars aren't there records of atlanteans and other cultures yeah so uh maybe so here's what we know. One of the things when, when I wrote the book, I, I came up with some rules like we've talked about. I said, okay, I can't assume anyone's an idiot just because they're, we're talking about history and prehistory. Uh, I have to know what Plato thought he meant when he wrote it. 
Um, you know, we talk about the Libyans got conquered, the Egyptians got conquered. We can't assume they're idiots. You know, so so everyone has to be seen as smart. Okay, uh, you know, I'm not. You can't assume stuff is religious or whatever. Uh, when it comes to other records, I said I have to find at least two corroborating sources outside of Plato that they can give it. They can corroborate him as the primary source. Um, and I did find one from another culture and one from inside of Greece, the same culture as, as Plato. Um, the one from inside of Greece is from this guy named Herodotus. And if you, if you can look him up. He's very famous. He wrote something called The Histories. He's really the world's first, uh, the wet, in the Western world, the first attempt to do real history. Um, and in his book, and what, what The Histories is, is he says, it's a huge, huge work. He says, here's everything we know about the world. That's the first half. And then the second half is here's what the Greeks were doing between like 500 BC and down to 480. 479 or 4, yeah, 479 or something like that. Um, and he mentions the Lanes. In fact, he says that if you went to Libya and uh, you turned to the west and you went for 10 days and then another 10 days, you'd run into these people that call themselves Atlanteans and they extend from there all the way to the base of the Atlas Mountains. And he says these people that call themselves Atlanteans, and this is like 500 BC ish, uh, they're really weird people. Uh, they have, they will tell you their name, but they will not let you write it down. And they will, they write nothing down. They do not record their names or, or the names of their kings or anything like that. Um, they spend their days uh, raging at the sun. Um, they don't dream, whatever that means. Uh, and they're vegetarians. So they're kooky. They're, they're weird. You know, they're, they're eccentric people. And when you look geographically where they are, it is where the remnants of people that call themselves Atlanteans would have ended up kind of in the Atlas Mountains at the foot of the Atlas Mountains. If this Rishat structure thing had been a capital, you know, and, and, and many, many years before it had been wiped out. This is where you go, where, where you're from. So, so that's, that, that corroborates Plato. By itself, it's not very helpful. It's not a very big mention, but but it's, a, it's an independent source. Then we have the Ottomans, which is the other culture that I found a specific reference to Atlantis um, that I believe we can trust. Uh, so there's this map called the Piri Rees map. And Piri Rees, have you heard of that? Yeah, it, they, doesn't it yeah. show Antarctica with no ice on it? Yeah, so so um, Charles Hapgood mentioned it. It's, it. The map is in the 1500s. Uh, Graham Hancock made it famous in 1995 with his book, Fingerprints of the Gods. And the, the map is said to have been commissioned by Piri Rees, uh, a, a, a cartographer of the king who went into all the archives and found all the ancient maps, all the old maps they had, and put everything together. Because we're talking 1500s. Remember, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, right? So we're just a generation. We're like we're in the 1850s, 18, uh, 1820s, 1830s here. Um, so the map got put together. And remember, this is not it's not a, a play exercise. This guy, Piri Reese, he's going to get on a boat and use this thing as to try and sail around the globe. So it, it's taken very seriously. And the map seems to show two things which have always been the focus of the map. On the left-hand side, it seems to show a lot more of the coastline um, of North and South America than could have possibly been known 20 years, 30 years after it was discovered. Um, on the bottom, it seems to show an accurate coastline of Antarctica, which is impossible because it's covered in ice, number one. And number two, it seems to show the water below the continental shelf and it seems to map that pretty well too of Antarctica. Mm. So it's like, okay, I mean, so there are arguments against it and all of that, but if, when you look at it yourself, it's like, oh man, that really looks close. So best case, it's debatable. But we've all been staring at this thing, right? For five, 600 years, whatever it is. And, and on the right-hand side of the map is the coast of Africa. And everyone just dismisses it. There's a big elephant on it and there's, there's mountains. But if you look, if you look, and it's all the way on the edge, there's this kooky little city surrounded by, a, in, inside a ring of water on an island, up, up a river that is blocked by mud off the coast, you know, off the coast of West Africa into where there's the Sahara today. Um, and, and it's exactly, when you when you overlay it, it's exactly where this eye of the Sahara Rishat structure is. It, it's, 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 it's exact. So, and, and so what are the odds? I mean, I mean, Piri Reese wouldn't accept the map with the river flowing up green mountains into the middle of the Sahara Desert where there's no, where there's nothing but sand, you know what I mean? So it was taken from a trusted map. Uh, and it seems to show, uh, like I said, a city surrounded by water, which is the exact description we have. That, that's the, you know, the, the main description, the visual description of Atlantis is there's a center island and two concentric 
rings of islands and water. And, and we see that on this map. And when we look in the Rishat structure, we, we see that exactly. So, it's, so then those are, those are two sources. And then I found a third source that no one ever talks about. And I'll mention it here. Um, Cause even in Plato's time, if you remember Plato, uh, he was uh, taught by Socrates. That was kind of his famous teacher. And then Plato taught Aristotle, who we've all heard of. Um, and Aristotle mentored Alexander the Great, who went over and, and took over Asia Minor and, and all that stuff. Uh, now Aristotle didn't buy this Atlantis thing. He he didn't he 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 didn't buy a lot of stuff Plato did. In fact, he became a critic of Plato, even though Plato was his teacher. Uh, but Plato established this thing called the Academy. It's like the first university. And when Plato died, uh, two people were up to to run the thing, whatever you want to call it. Uh, one was um, Aristotle, and the other was this guy named Crantor. Okay. Now, now Aristotle had broken from the, the Platonic traditions or, or was in the process of breaking from Crantor very much believed. And he believed in Atlantis and all that stuff. And Crantor was the one who seceded Plato and took over the academy. So in the time, Crantor kind of won that, that battle. And Aristotle pouted off and went and did his own thing. Brilliant man, had a wonderful career. Uh, but Crantor says uh, that he believed this so much, but there was a lot of criticism on it. So he says he went to Egypt and verified the information so we we had that now we, we don't we don't he wasn't like plato we don't get to see a written account of his verification but we do have have the historical documents to say he verified it so that's that, that's two um uh, corroborating sources and then a third source that seems to vouch for plato uh, which is about as good as you're going to get because we're talking about 2600 years ago you know, we're talking about 400 BC. So, so that's pretty good corroboration. We, we would accept that today uh, in a court of law. We would accept that that level of, uh, in a certain what they call circumstantial case, we, we would accept that. So yeah, so there you go. I love that you bring up circumstantial case because we talk about this all the time. There's circumstantial cases for Bigfoot we've talked about, you know, they have prints and video. If that would, would be applied to a criminal case, there would be no question. Yeah, well, and so what we're looking for, because these are all, it, it, history is circumstantial, all of it, every yeah. every bit of history, everything, and in fact, that well, when we started this conversation, that's now circumstantial evidence, but we recorded it, so we can go back, <laughs> we can go back to watch it. So what we want to do is we want to, we're in the process, we'll, the burden around something like Atlantis is to build what they call an overwhelming circumstantial case, which is what you're trying to do. So you have to have so many data points that even if, some of them come unraveled or or, or, or or borderline. There's so many more that we can agree the circumstances are what what they seem to point to. And we have that with, with the Rishat structure in Atlantis. And I'm happy to go into them. There's all kinds of data points where this thing lines up with everything we could possibly know. And, and so you have to ask yourself, I mean, if, they've, if it really doesn't line up 99.32% and it doesn't conflict with anything we know about history, what's the chances that Plato just randomly wrote this down to, and, and, and it just magically, you know, fits so well, right. you know? Yeah, so we're not talking 50%, you, you know, we're, 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 we're almost indisputable. There is nothing that doesn't match when it comes right down to it. That's incredible. Yeah. How long has the book been available? Uh, since April. And where is it available? Amazon. And tell me the title of the book again. Atlantis solved the final definitive proof by David Edwin. And I so, have, oh, go ahead, James. Go ahead. I, so I have a question. So, when they make the documentary about this, who's are you going to narrate it yourself, or are you going to have someone narrate it? Well, it's. I don't know if that's a joke. I, I have a no, pitch no. In. I, hey, okay, I yeah, love, yeah. I, I have a pitch in with the Discovery Channel. Um, oh my God. Yeah, it went in in May. They're, they're supposed to evaluate all pitches within eight weeks, but we're we're past that by by a little bit. But Discovery is going through some things right now, so I can't I can't be too critical of them. Um, but I actually have we have um, uh, people who you would know uh, who are also experts in this area and passionate about it lined up um, to to be the narrator and, um, and and that kind of stuff. So it, it'll be a, it'll be a very high quality documentary. And no, I won't be I'm, I will not be the narrator. My my wonderful nasally voice is, is is great for you know twenty minute podcast, but I don't know, two hours of it might, <laughs> might overwhelm the audience. Yeah. So well, David, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing with us about Atlantis. I never knew. I really thought. Um, I didn't realize that the, there was so much information out there about Atlantis. 
because you just get the you get the like you said the aliens and the death ray stuff that's what i know about atlantis there is look what what for me I used to, growing up, I used to love arguing politics. It was just fun for me. You can't do that anymore. Atlantis, same number of passionate people, same number of sides, you know, but you can argue it all day long and you can yell at each other and get mad or whatever. And it's not, you know, but you don't leave as enemies, you know? So it's, right. just, it's a fun yeah. place. And it's just, there's something kind of magical about it or there's something that is, I'm drawn to understanding this kind of history. So it's, it's just a wonderful place to, to spend time and keep your head. I would agree. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. Thank you. Yeah, thank uh, Kelly you. James, thank you. You know, <clears throat> even though David shattered some of my childhood dreams, you know, that there's no crystal and stuff, it was cool. You know? And it's, it's funny how he... He got interested by watching someone on YouTube and it interested him so much where he decided to research it. And I hope that's something that we can do. Some of our listeners may hear something we say and say, oh, I'm going to check that out and see what's going on. And maybe they get interested and go and study. And the next thing you know, they're writing a book. Right. Yeah, I told them, you know, I always, my, my deal, when I think of Atlantis, I think of Patrick Duffy with the webbed hand and feet. Oh, he was bad though, yeah. In the TV show Atlantis, he could swim really fast, you know, and that's really all, you know, and Atlantis was always kind of this mythical place. And I always know that they were supposed to have superior technology and superior like everything, but it was really interesting the way that he put it, because you're right, he kind of dashed a lot of my things that I thought about Atlantis (laughs) as well, James, so. You know, but it's nice to have somebody come and, and break it down for us. Yeah, it was cool. You know, yep. and it's interesting, you know, Atlantis has been around in culture, pop culture, you know, since its existence, you know, let's say. Uh Aquaman, you know, Atlantis is there. The new Black Panther, the person is Submariner, he's gonna be coming from Atlantis, but they're putting a Mayan spin on it, I heard. Oh, okay. See? You know, and then you know, I heard about Edgar Casey, the American prophet, they call him. Him talking about Atlantis, but he was talking about it being in the Bahamas. You know? So it's interesting. You know, it's an it's interesting subject. It is. Yeah. So if you are interested in reading David's book, you can get it on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. The name of the book title is Atlantis Solved, The Definitive Proof. All right, sir. So you want to get into some, some random bullshit? Yeah, I got some random bullshit. Let's, see oh, let's hear it. And it's kind of tied in to what we're talking about water. <laughs> uh, okay, people say there's no global warming, right? You know, there's, there's people who are denying it and stuff. And it's funny, I've been, <clears throat> I study, or I follow a lot of uh, fishing websites. Do you, and, wait, wait, okay. Um, I just have to interject. Yeah. James, I have known you for a long time and I have never known you to be this avid fisher person. So I'm really surprised that you follow Fisherman websites. Well, it's like Field and Stream. I used to get the magazine when I was a kid. Okay. There's some other ones, you know. All right. But uh, so what Stream you need to know about uh, what you need to know about fish, big fish like deep water. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. So with global warming, you know, there's not as much water, not as much precipitation. These deep waters are starting to dry up. Okay. So now anglers have more access to these big fish. And they're pulling in big fucking fish. So you're saying that them pulling in big fish is actually a bad thing. In my opinion. Because that is a that is a signal that the water is getting smaller and that the bigger fish are not having anywhere to go but up. Right. Well, they're, just, well, they're staying down where they were. But they're staying, the, but if the water is getting if the water down, is yeah. getting smaller, then there's nowhere for them to go. So right. we're actually coming to them. They're not coming to us. Pretty much, you know. But I thought that was interesting. And then another thing, 
they've been finding a lot of dinosaur prints lately too. Oh, this, I, this river, you know, dried up. Oh, look, what is that? Dinosaur print. You know, here in Utah, Texas, I want to say China. So, you don't, you know, that's just my layman's take on global climate change. That it's real. In my opinion, it's real. It's not scientific. But sometimes people go, want all that science and don't understand it. Maybe they understand that. True. So my random bullshit is I heard a really spooky, spooky noise. And that was the noise of a black hole. Have you heard this? They've recorded oh. the black hole. You can now hear the sound. And it is an ominous, eerie, frightening sound to me. I haven't heard it yet. It yeah. sounds like many, 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 many people screaming in pain. It oh, sounds oh. like what the depths of hell would sound like to me. Oh, have you ever seen that movie Event, Event Horizon? Yes. That's kind. Of, that's what that was about. Yeah. So it, it, the sound is to me was just, just really. I mean, if you haven't heard it, you can go to YouTube. You can go anywhere. It's out there. You can go listen to it. I don't have a bite for you here, unfortunately. But it it was scary. It 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 was a very scary sound. Knowing that they say that there's no sound in space, but I beg to differ. There is sound well, in space. Well, they say no one can hear you scream. That's what, how would they know? Have they been out there screaming? Sounded like people were screaming to me in that black hole, but that was just me. Maybe that's just me and my mind and all the, every movie I've ever saw, but that's what it, that's where it it took me. I did hear they recorded the magnetic waves that come from the sun that hit earth. And those sound like, well, well, it sounds serious. I'll have to listen to this hell screaming one. It's the sound of a black hole. Like that? It just, just go listen to it. It just sounds scary to me. All right. I didn't like it. And that is random bullshit. But I have a an announcement as far as social media. So this is my segue into social media. You can go to our website, that's some crazy shit podcast.com. You can get us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and da, 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 LinkedIn. LinkedIn Finally. has let us create a page using the word shit. Oh my God, I can't believe it. I know what I said. You, you know, I see people selling booty pictures on LinkedIn, but they won't let us use the word shit. They have taken it down, but now it's up. I don't, I think it will stay up because it let me post. So we are now on LinkedIn as well. For all you intellects who thought, huh, they'll never make it. Guess what? We did. Uh Uh-oh. We're just chugging along now. Chugging along. So that is all that we have this time. Next week, we'll have another fantastic guest as we are just making our way through season seven. So exciting. Season seven. We're coming up on 100 episodes. Coming up on 100 episodes. So my friend, Until next time, keep your minds open.